Yes. What you are to do within uh, your research majorly is uh, on working on interviews. To interview people either physically or interview them in a discussion, group discussion and others. This also has implications and has something that you need to be put into consideration. Here I'm saying that there are some such that are sensitive. There are some such that are sensitive. And a sensitive topic is one which potentially poses for those involved a substantial threat. Um, you go to interview people, especially in, a, in an atmosphere like as it is in Rwanda, for example, uh, that if somebody has to talk about uh, the leader of a country or some other things, the emergence of which renders the problematic for the researcher and all the research, the collection holding and submission of the research. So the, that time when there is that sensitivity that, pose, that is posed on a researcher or on a, on a person that you are searching on and other things. So if there is tension into this, and you are supposed to do the interview, what should you do as a researcher? What should you do as a researcher? If there is a potential threat, a potential threat, and it is uh, foreseen that there must be a threat, what would you do as a researcher? So, uh, there are some researches that you will develop into some into some deep personal experiences. And uh, you are doing a study, and this study goes into uh, personal experiences, what the person has experienced over time and time, all concerned with the uh, defiance or social control. We have seen, like, you know, when the uh, weather it's opposition, the government it's opposition, or the government is doing some study and there is, uh, there is some defiance or there is control that is being done. And you are, you are searching on somebody who is defying and the person does not want to be known or whatever. What impinges on the vested interests of powerful persons or exercises the coercion of the nation? I'm told, I'm told, I'm not, this is not uh, scientifically proven, that currently if you have a relative working for government, government and civil servant. And this relative is working in a, in a, in a government position. One day or the other, they discover that he has a, a husband or a wife or a sister or a brother who is in opposition. This person is put into danger. How would you approach this person, asking them sensitive issues that will reveal what they are and what if their revelation causes a lot of problems? All deals with the things sacred to those being studied, which they do not wish to be profaned. Uh, I give an example. Every region has some places, some things, some objects, some symbols they hold sacred. You could uh, be doing a study on things that a certain group of people hold as sacred. How do you deal with them? For example, if you were to do a study on the Catholic sacraments, especially the Eucharist, and somebody sees you doing anything to eat, you can you can easily you can easily fall into serious problems. How do you do it? How do you do this type of sensitive study? How do you do sensitive study that will pose a problem to you or to other persons that are involved in doing this? And how do you do a, an interview into these areas? So, <clears throat> there are safeguards that we need to think about. To this level. There are some safeguards. Questioning of the social and scientific value of the research should, should the research be conducted. So what, what I'm saying. If it is into this kind of category, should the research and questioning into these things be done? 
Should it be done? The answer definitely should be yes or no. I know in the past there are uh, people who tried to object to the Catholic principle of the Eucharist and, the, and Jesus is present in the Eucharist. And they stole the host to go and check for the actually the substance in the host is Jesus. The end, those years, was inquisition. Should such and such be studied? First is that you, as a researcher, you must be an expert and gauge what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And also know that this is a sensitive subject. You go around to see whether you can do a study on it or you leave it. Another one on the interview is the vulnerable participants, members of the minority parties. If you could simply go to uh, Rwanda, for me, gives an example of where we can really study on, on this, the, the vulnerable okay. participants. Uh, if you were studying something about governance in that country, and you know that the leadership in the country does not allow any dissent at all in the position, can you go and interview members of a political party and knowing that if their knowledge, if what they have shared with you will cause them a, a, a problem or a danger, or members of outward groups or mentally competent people. These are people who are very vulnerable. Members of the oppressed groups, these people with mental illness, prisoners, homeless people, those traumatized with pain and ill. The vulnerable participants may or may not be those involved in such or sensitive topics. They could also be people who that study can influence, can influence in a way you, you, you do or no a study on, on political parties and uh, democracy in Rwanda, and you know that if this study goes out, what, what falls next is to on, that is causing a danger. So what do you do as a person who is to interview? So the consent that you will back at the produce that time was that there must be an essential consent from persons who are to be involved. And this means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give a consent. It is sensitive, but then you have to get informed consent if you have to do it. And should be able to exercise the free power of choice without an intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, or duress, or coercion. I should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension. So it means that the study can be done, but with full consent of all people who are supposed to take part into that, that study. So meaning that you are given power to interview people on anything, as long as, not anything please, uh, we, are, we are free to interview people as long as they have shown absolute consent of what is to be studied and also, that's the kind of thing that you are talking about. My slides. The digital responsible for ascertaining the quality of consent based upon each individual who initiates, directs, or engages in the experiment and is a personal duty that may not be delegated. So you cannot say, ask your father said, I can interview you, or your father said me to you, it's something that you may not be delegated, so it must be done. And these are the elements of, of informed consent. These are elements that you need to be in, in informed consent. One is disclosure. General, general necessary items to disclose include 
alternative available procedures of management. So we first look at the other ways. So we have other means or other ways in which I can do this study, I can do this interview. If there are safer alternatives, go for those alternative interviews. Another alternative uh, ways in which you can do the interview. You can only do that interview where there is danger, when there is no other option. When there is no other option. And so the research benefits of both from the study, of both from the study, you as the person who doing the study and the person who are, are interviewing, the statement of offering opportunity to ask further questions, and in the case of research, is right to withdraw in a time. So people can decide to say, okay, I withdraw because it's, it, is, it, is, it is causing me problems. And if the person withdraws and says, please don't use my, my, my data, then as a researcher, you must not, you must not disclose it. The second one is voluntariness. Voluntariness. The participant must be of his own free will to make choice without being and pressured by anyone else. And being free in making a decision means that the participant owns the decision. So that's why I say that it's not delegated. It's not delegated. The person must be, the work must be voluntary, and that voluntariness is very, very important in this regard. Then the other one is competence, participants capacity for decision making. One is considered competent when you have a decision, or you have made a decision, one can choose between alternatives, uh, you have to decide. One has the capacity to justify one's choice, that is, person can give reason for the choice, one justifies one's choice in a reasonable manner. And these are safeguards, was said by, by a surrogate decision maker, if necessary. There are sometimes when you want to do, and this is more in two scientific areas, um, the surrogate issues, these are really scientific areas where we are doing uh, such humans as such. Uh, so I think this is not very, very, very important. Except for private um, confidentiality and privacy, that you have to be you have to be uh, confidential okay. in all observations. Confidential, even in the discussion that you have, you have, you have, you have, you have, you have been on, also in reporting and other things. Some question because I want to jump to ethical leadership, which is also big and very good. Questions, questions? Professor. Yes, please. Professor. Yes, Professor. Yes, my question goes back to the categories of people that you can interview. Yes. Uh, you, you talked about a person who is mentally uh, not upright. Yes. One, I don't think there is any scenario where you need to, inter to interview a mad person. I did I say that you go to a person you have the person must always be into the mental order. So in case okay. continue please. I rest, I rest my case. I think we are not having you very well. So let's go to part three. If we went into a long time, we are this part three, which we are really murdering seriously. But we, um, the good thing is that we have had the skills to how to study, and uh, these are ethical foundation for public policy. Are there foundations on which we can engage into doing public policy? The first one is political policy engagement in such. Um, um, this is, I think you know, I think in the military you know them very well. Um, 
because that's that's your study, you know, it's better than me. I think that's the question. Uh, because that's that's your study, you know, it's better than me. I just want to go into a scholarship. <laughs> to a scholarship. No, no, no. We shall start from here. I'll start from here. So, ethical foundation of, of ethics in public policy has a number of tenets that we think about. The first one is the preferential option for the poor and the vulnerable. That when we are working on policies, there is a very big tendency that we make policies for, for people in power, people who are already connected. And when we deal with people who are connected, in many ways we disregard the non-elite and people who are vulnerable. <clears throat> but people who have done policies with a very sincere way is that we have far doing things for universal for everyone. So some of these you know, making noise. Who could be making noise? I don't know who. So what I'm saying is that there's always a they say that we make policies for the benefit of people who are in power and who are powerful. But the foundation for public policy and a good public policy is to be for everyone. And for everyone to look at people who could be vulnerable by these policies. So a focus on supporting or working alongside and sharing with people who are living in Children, women and men must be most vulnerable to the extreme of poverty and injustice are rich in the eyes of God. Let me say of God, I am, I use this like somewhere else, so the eyes of God. And companionship to women, men and children who are vulnerable in these circumstances is very good. So we avoid, avoid making selective policies. And this is the first, first foundation on which policy is built ethically. The option for poor includes talking with and listening to those who are living in poverty, people who are not educated, people who are voiceless, and make policy speak to them, speak for them, speak with them, and then give them the necessary element of enjoying the common good and also coming up to join the class of those who are the privileged class that we are trying to support, or that people normally want to support. So with the preferential option for the poor, it is more, sorry. With the preferential option for the poor, it is more than charity alone. It is seeking justice at all levels of society involves tackling those structures which keep people living in poverty and live at the edges or margins of our society. And we know that most politicians, most people who are in the policy related areas, they want to keep their positions. And want to keep their positions, they want to keep those who, whom they lead or who keep them on remain what they are, so that you can always drive over them. I'm not talking to anyone now, but you remember, you know, that actually uh, some leaders in Africa are happy to lead the people who are in utter poverty, in ignorance, who can not oppose them and, and the others. And even, even at, 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 at institutions like, like a university or even a small church or even a school, many leaders prefer to leave people who cannot even question them. So. A policy that uplifts every individual society is that, and it is on which that foundation we are talking about is built, so that we create, we, we try not to create or perpetuate inequality, but hold people accountable 
in areas where we are, we are moving together as humans. Um, I think uh, people have been in the parliament these days uh, will tell us how the parliamentarians will think about increasing their salary. Uh, knowing that a, head, a teacher of a school who is teaching your children, our children, is earning as little as 500,000 shillings. A, 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 a police constable is earning, I think, 300 or something things. And somebody who is only attending sessions in the parliament writes billions of money. Yeah. Okay. So meaning that people who are involved in all these policy levels would love to stop them from coming near them. So you use this money to, to bribe voters and keep in that privileged position, and this is not something that is that is encouraged anyway or anyhow. Mm. Professor, I just wanted to ask a question. Oh, please. Um, on that issue, uh, just for argument's sake, yes, I may not subscribe to what I'm asking for. Yes. But for instance, you're talking about uh, what I hear you talking about is equity. Yes. Um, whereby you do strive to ensure that everyone is uplifted to the same level that you are on. Yes. Taking the example of the university, for instance, yes. there is a professor uh, is probably lecturing, uh, teaching a class of seven, like we are. Yes. Is earning, is earning more than a, a, a lecturer who is teaching a class of 400. Yes. Uh, and uh, because of numbers, the one who's teaching 400, the idea they should earn more. Mm -hmm. But here we have a professor teaching only seven students, is earning more by virtue of qualification mm -hmm. and the positioning. Uh, so would that be unethical? Uh, you have to first understand the, the systems or the policies that are at universities. This is mm -hmm. They are, um, as much as I know, most educational centers is that they will have uh, a minimum, well, a maximum, which somebody has to have in the class. For example, mm. at the university, the maximum is 72 students for mm. social, uh, social sciences. And I think, um, 40, I don't remember because I'm now I know what I'm at 44 science classes. So when you get a number beyond that, mm. beyond at my university, at Uganda Matras University, the is paid mm. for them. There is extra payment. Uh, mm. There's extra payment. Okay. Um, and I think that's how what, what is in most most institutions of higher learning, those that are really ESCO, that is uh, extra, extra. So if I mark papers of a course and there is, uh, I, I go beyond seven days or two, I, mm. I extra money for the scripts as a teacher that I've done. Um, okay. So somebody who's an ESCO in this regard is this other person. Who is in charge of uh, distributing goods? Goods now I'm talking about lessons. And he wants lessons, he wants, he wants money, and he takes all those classes that are going to seven, he gets the same salary. Yeah? Because we are using the same time, but more, more time maybe in marking, and he takes all mm. those courses for himself. This is in <coughs> all of these random people like me, who teaches seven students, and you know that uh, when I'm marking them, I take only 10 minutes and I finish. This is, this mm -hmm. is. So the ethical one is the one who says, okay, let us look at the question of equity, equality, and others. And we distribute goods according to the way they're supposed to be distributed. Do this, you seem to be in the disagreement. <laughs> Um, not not exactly. I'm I'm appreciating um, the different viewpoints, but I'm, I'm also having this battle within me 
which is which is not so far from what Moses, not so far from the issue Moses is raising. Um, it, it is true we do need a just and equitable society. We need a society where the poor are taken adv- are, are taken care of and provided for. But I think um, in reality, we cannot have a society where there is 100% equality. That is not possible, I think. I think the best we can do... Let's first lay it down. Equality is not possible. Um, Yes. I remember I read the the work of um, one ethicist, the Jewish ethicist, who was working on equality. He's called um, Michael Oza. Mm. And it talks about a tribe of people or a group of people. They said, no, no, we have to really fight for equality. And mm-hmm. they came together and said, okay, let us get somebody to lead us. <laughs> Immediately by saying, let's get somebody to lead us, you are creating government. And this government... Exactly. <laughs> and this government is... That's true. Different measures within, the, within, that, within the organization that we are quite working on. Yes. So... Um, I mean, even when you look back at biblical times, there is still a master-slave relationship. Somebody is always going to be above the other. But I think it is important, of course, in our generation that we try as much as possible to narrow that inequality gap so that it's not so big. At least people can have something, but they may not have all. Even when, it, when we talk about fighting poverty, we cannot eliminate poverty. We can only do as much as reduce. Which brings me to the other issue of um, capitalism. I know a lot of times we look at the evils of capitalism, but personally, I try to take the positives in capitalism. We live in a society where I know no one wants to be poor, but there are people who actually escape poverty because they work 10 times as hard as everyone else. They put in a lot of effort to get out of that situation then you find some people who seem to be comfortable even when you come up with initiatives to get them out of that situation. Somehow they self-sabotage and find themselves back in that trap of poverty. So it becomes really, really hard to plan and think for people like that, you know? And, And true, we want to get people out of poverty, but people must also, at that micro or individual level, make an effort. Try to have some ownership that says, okay, I don't want to be in this situation and I need to also fight to get out of this situation. We don't need to create a situation where people get too comfortable that someone is coming to deliver me from this situation. That, that's, that's just what I wanted to contribute. Oh, okay. Can I contribute also? Can I first ask you before, before Moses, uh, can sure. you try to, to make a, dif- a difference between equity and equality? Well, equity uh, to me is... Oh, is Moses? Is that for Moses? Uh, professor, I've just shared something on WhatsApp. I can't share on, uh, on the screen the difference between equality and equity. Mm. Mm. So, uh, by... Yeah, I've seen it. So, when you're, talking, when you're talking about equality, you are having the same the same benefits, but it does not mean that you will necessarily be better. For instance, when you look at that Kasmolo, the short man, mm-hmm. they, have put, they have given him the same, same resources, but he cannot still see in the field, but he has been, in, he has given, he has been given something. However, what is possible is equity, whereby you lose something, for the benefit of the other. And in this case, you look, when you see the gentleman, before I went his stool, so that is able to boost the vulnerable. And then both of them are able to watch the same, the same match. So <laughs> equality, equity has a sacrifice, but equity is more of access to the same resources, but does not necessarily mean one will be empowered. Mm-hmm. Can you explain yes. it just a bit further now that I have shared it? Mm. What I was saying about equality, uh, when you look uh-huh. at equality, 
equality means you share the same things. For instance, if we are in class, all of us give us the same marks. Okay. If we are getting salary, all of us get the same salary. But does not mean that I will be better because I have other deficiencies. And when you are talking about equity, you are trying to address if, uh, the deficiencies so that I am boosted to be able to attain the same benefit or closer to what you have uh, mm -hmm. and then we share equally. So when you look at equality, for instance, all of them have the same stools, mm -hmm. but the younger man cannot still watch the match. Mm -hmm. But there have been equal distribution of resources. Mm -hmm. However, when you look at equity, one of them will have to have self conscious to know I am able to sustain myself with this, but I can forego this for the good of so and so. Mm -hmm. That is why you see this gentleman has foregone his stool and given it to the younger man with the appreciation that if I empower this person, they will be able to reach at a level where all of us can share the same benefit. That's why you see, after he has given him a stool, they are, all of them are able at the same time to watch you and enjoy the match. Somebody else mm. here, but continue to continue the discussion. Mm. So, colleagues, I don't know if it, it, uh, Judith, especially, who had asked the question. I don't know. No, I, I, I understood equality and equity. I was, I was just making a contribution in line with what you had actually raised earlier. But I have mm. understood this. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Moses. Yes. Moses. Why are you civil? Still, equity. The equity side. If we choose mm. to have uh, a society where we empower the short, the weak, the poor, so that we get the same level. Still, as Judith said, there are those that are naturally not able to make it, even however much you push them. Either uh, it is meant to be, either it is their way of thinking or things, however much you push them or pull them or lift them up, they will never make it to this level. I want to think that a just society is a society whereby everyone is in his own class. I mean, if you strive to, to, to get from class B to class A, I mean, that is like the way to go. If you're connected with what you have, because trust me, there are those guys that can't even afford a single room, you know? They can't go deep, they can't go face, they can't go harvest, they can't go hunting. I mean, they are contented. And there are those who fight, as you say, work 10 times more than others to make it in life. I mean, we can't have equity, trust me. So let me try to make a conclusion. I think you have, uh, have uh, had enough. And um, I thank Moses for this good picture that he has presented for us. Is that uh, when we are making uh, policies, we have to run away from questions of equality, but go into equity. Yeah. How, how we allow everybody to access what needs to be accessed? Equality yes. creates that kind of uh, the first the first picture that you see. This short man is not able to, to watch the football. I don't know that's football or rugby. I don't know what the name is. But we, when we do things in an equitable form, everybody is to get what is necessary for everybody to see. So I, I think what you are talking about is purely portrayed within this good picture that you have given us. We try equity, equity especially in levels that we put for vulnerable people are marginalized minorities so that they can access what even the elites or the powerful society are getting i have three minutes more we could continue a bit then i see stop sharing Um, 
I just wanted to look at what we call <coughs> dimensions of sin. We have personal sins, we have social sins, we have structural sins. And you allow me to, to talk about it on its own. And we see that when, whenever we are making policies, and the policies that are very bad, we are actually moving into making structures that create a, a sinful situation in which people live and operate in. Um, what do we mean by personal sins? This, the sin that harms me and my neighbors, and for religious, it harms my relations with God. This is personal. Uh, it is something that is in me, that I suffer alone by God and by me. And if you go into the social scene, this is, this is the social dimension of sin that affects society and the world through, hurting people through attacks in life, their freedoms, their dignity, or their human rights, and hurting God's creation through the practice of the dam, the land, the God's creatures, the environment, and others. This is, this is why we call this the social sin. Hurting people through attacks on life, freedom, dignity, and human rights. So when we are making policies, and policies that do in create social problems, here we are entering into an where it is not acceptable in ethical terms. And, and here, we are talking about the structures of sin, those structural sins. The structural dimension of sin stems from personal sin, from the end, results from collective choices of many and is sustainable by the selfishness. These are the points that we are making. Becomes a barrier to and affects. I I have just to less than one minute, so maybe I, I cross the stuff again. Eh? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where do I end from? Well, I would end because if you are not, you must give me what I want. 